Uh, we're starting our series on the book of James. How many of you know that in life we go through difficult times? Anybody here immune from troubles, cares, trials, sufferings of life? Anybody who says, oh no, things are just going straight. In life, we go through a lot of hardships. We go through tough times sometimes. And uh, we need to hold on to God. And it's an interesting book that we're about to read, you know, starting this series called Faith Walk. How do we keep going? How do we keep walking in those environments when things are pressing us hard? When life really is difficult, how do you keep going? When everything, you, you, no matter how hard you try to work hard, or you try to push hard, but life seems to be taking you in a different um, course altogether. How do you keep going? So um, for the whole time in the book of James, we're going to be collecting these shoes, as you can see. And um, uh, these shoes, they've got a story to tell each and every pair of these shoes, where the places they've gone, the stories of uh, they've been actually through. These are very special shoes. Uh, they're from, I'm not going to mention name, but my youngest, uh, reluctantly, after a few months of of saying, come on, I need these shoes, uh, has finally succumbed and, um, and given in. I said, you've definitely become a Christian, definitely. Uh, and so uh, these shoes tell a story of where, you, where people have been, and there are lots of shoes here. Each and every shoe, uh, there are different places that people have been and, and stories of life, the hardship of life that they've gone through. And, and as a church, we want to be able to to help others and continue to be a church that give of ourselves as we give out these shoes to others. But as we are giving out these shoes, we want to also to be reminded of our own story, of our own journey, our own walk. Amen. Amen. Every one of us is on a walk, is on a journey. And here is what the book of James is really about. Here is why this book of James is a great book. It's a fantastic book. It's a very practical way to live your life, your life of faith. But here is why the book of James is so good. Whether you've been a Christian for four days or you've been a Christian for 30 years, I want to put us all on the same playing field here. There is nobody in this room who has conquered the book of James. Amen, somebody. Nobody in this room who can say, actually, I've managed to conquer the book of James. There's nobody in this book that, you know, because the book of James talks about not being biased. And many of us are biased, isn't it? We... We only do things that we like and we favor some people and we do all sorts of things. And, and also it talks about not being a hypocrite. The book of James talks about controlling your tongue. Now, I don't like talking about people, but every now and again I have to watch what I say that I don't end up talking about people. You know what I'm saying? And every one of us here, we wrestle with the tongue. Whether we're upset, whether we don't like what's going on, our tongue, if it's not muzzled, it will end up just saying things and spewing up things. That's not right. And James is going to address that. The book of James talks about meeting the needs of those who are in need, the poor. How can we be the people of God? How can we go out and reach out and share with others what God has shared, given to us? It talks about everything practical in the book of James. Today, I'm just going to be laying out the foundation of where we are going over the next few weeks. This is an incredible book. It's only five chapters. You can probably read it in 15 minutes. If you're a fast reader like Margaret, you can probably read it in 15 minutes. It's a very practical living for the immature believer as well as for the mature believer. Everyone, every one of us here, we can get something from the book of James. Now, if you want to think about the book of James, uh, uh, let me just ask you this question. If somebody were to sit next to you in front of you and they start telling you a story about their life, you know, and their whole life was just perfect, you know, they, they, uh, they are from this lovely island and the whole life, you know, everything is just literally perfect. You know, like silver spoon, perfect life, no, no mistakes, no nothing. Would you like listening to that story? I, I, I don't like listening to the story. If it's a movie, I quickly fast forward it. Or if it's a book, I jump the pages. But if somebody were to come and sit in front of me and they tell me, you know what? 
I've been through this, I've been through this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and God saw me through. I'm like, tell me more. I want to hear more. There's something that happens inside of us when we hear the stories of how God has seen his people through. And so, your trials and your hardships, they are not in vain. Just tell the person next to you, the trials you are going through right now. And the hardship that you're going through, they are not in vain. Amen, somebody? That is, if you allow God, he will use every single thing that you're going through, no matter how hard it is. Now, many of us have gone through some serious stuff. That if we were to come up on this stage and we start telling, you say, Pastor, you have no idea. The kind of life that I've had to walk through. You have no idea where I've been. You have no idea the story of my life. But can I just tell you this morning that whatever situation you have gone through, it was not in vain. If you allow God to use that story, he will take your brokenness and he will take your situation and he will use it for his glory. Amen, somebody. I'm here because of his grace. I'm not here because I'm good. I'm not here because I've been in some places, even in my mind, but God has kept me through all of that situation. Amen, somebody. And so our trials and our hardships, they are not in vain. If we allow God, you know, sometimes in our lives, your greatest pain turns into your greatest ministry. God takes your pain and he uses it as your greatest ministry. That is if you allow God to do that in your life. Amen. Choose to allow God to use what you're going through today as ministry. God, whatever I'm going through here, how can I be a blessing to other people? How can you use what I'm going through, God, for your glory? I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't understand why you're allowing all of this to happen. But God... You are sovereign somewhere, somehow. You understand what I'm going through. And so I am going to let you be God in my life. Let's let God be God, isn't it? Come on, it's okay to say amen in church, you know. Amen, amen, amen. We, We have to allow God to be God. And when we allow God to be God, he takes our pain, our suffering. And he says, I'm going to use it as a testimony. As a testimony. So you you stand up here and you say, I just want to share with you what God has done for me. You know, over the whole last year, life was just hard, you know. And nobody knew what I was going through, but God was with me. And somebody sitting there going through difficult times, they say, I I know what you're talking about. I hear, I feel you. I hear what you're talking about. And, And all of a sudden, they find strength in themselves. Amen, church. So we got to share our testimonies, right? What God has done in us. So the book of John, Jesus gets uh, before his disciples, and here's what he says. He says, in this world, you are going to have troubles. Come on, we're going to have some what? Jesus, you are Jesus. Come on, you have come so that we may have life. And yet you are telling your disciples, you are telling all of us that in this world, We will have some trouble. We are going to go through issues. And what he's doing is he's helping them understand that life is going to be incredibly hard. It's going to be difficult. Nothing is easy about this life that we live in in this flesh. And he says, but take heart. Take heart for I have overcome the world. Just tell your your spirit right now. Take heart, take heart. Whatever difficulty that you may be going through, take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. And so we need to walk as people who who belong to Jesus who has overcome the world. You know, sometimes the enemy comes and he vexes us, he kicks us about, and he comes and he, he annoys us and annoys our spirits. I mean, the devil sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes he comes and plays golf right in front of your eyes. Have you seen that? He just comes and poke you and poke you and poke you. I don't want to talk, man. I don't want to be involved in this. And he comes and he's trying to provoke you. And you need to take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. Do not take the bait, but actually begin to respond and say, hey, I choose to rise above it. But many of us actually, when the enemy comes, just just check this afternoon, your spouse is going to come and they will just do some robotic movements. And all of a sudden, it annoys you right into your spirit. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It could be your children, right? Don't raise your hand so high, my sister, right? (laughs) 
It could be your children, right? Your children, they will come and they will do something to annoy you kind of thing. They don't know that they're being used. They, they, they're not meaning it that way. But the enemy says, I'm going to use them. I'm going to use you. Sometimes he uses us as well to be the devil, to provoke others. And so you just find yourself, oh, I'm just, I don't know why I'm just irritated today. I'm just irritated today. No, 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 no. I know life is going to be difficult. So when we get into the book of James, let's get into the book of James. We're just starting, so I need to go easy because we're just starting. This is who James is. James is the half-brother of Jesus. In fact, at one point in time, Jesus tried, uh, you know, had this discussion. Um, you know, James had this discussion with Jesus. Uh, James and other family members, they came to Jesus. They said, hey, Jesus, man. You're acting like you are the son of God. What's this about? What's going on? You know, well, you're acting like you're, you're talking like you are the son of God. Are you crazy? You, you can't go on like this. Remember, he's the half-brother, right? And, and so, he, you, know, you know, he's telling of Jesus. And what happens then is that Jesus died and Jesus was resurrected to life. And James is seeing all this and he goes, oh, no. I guess, yes, you are the son of God. You are the one. You are from there. And then we see that from then on, James's life is forever transformed. He says, I would go wherever you say. I would do whatever you say to do, Jesus, because I realize now you are the son of God. Man, when you have that revelation of Jesus, it changes your life. From one point, James was saying, Jesus, are you crazy? Are you, you're talking like you are the son of God. You are not the Messiah. You are not the one that's to come. And then Jesus dies and he was resurrected. This revelation happened in front of James. And now James says, hey, whatever you say, I am going to do. Wherever you lead me, I will go. Are you in that place this morning where you say, God, wherever you lead me, I'm going to go. Wherever you say, I have this revelation of who you are. And so now it's no more about me, but it's now about you. So, so Jesus, and, uh, and so what he then does, James, after that, James begins to preach. He begins to write. He begins to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because now he has this new revelation that he has. And so he writes this book. It's very important that we know why he writes this book. In chapter 7 of Acts, we have Stephen, right? Stephen is the first martyr who was actually uh, preaching the gospel. And, and they surround Stephen. They kill Stephen by throwing rocks at Stephen. And Stephen is just knelt down there. He's been killed for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because Stephen has said, I am going to abandon myself to Jesus and it's no more about me, but my whole life is now surrendered to Jesus. And so Stephen, as he's knelt down there and they're throwing these rocks and they just kill him. They kill him. In chapter 8, you know, Saul, who we now know as Paul, Sometimes, you know, Saul comes to the Christian and he says, he's kind of, you know, he spewed some fire and anger to the Christians. And he says, if you keep following this Jesus, I'm going to annihilate all of you. I'm going to put it in layman's term. It's like Saul just comes through those doors and he says, if you people keep meeting here, I'm going to do something very bad. Got children here. I'm going to do something very bad. And so you better leave town. And so Sister Cam is the first one to run. And she, and she goes and she says, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming back here. Uh, the pastor is following behind. Uh, I'm not coming back here because, you know, we've been warned. We are not to meet. How many people will come next week? That's right. Nobody, right? Because we are afraid to die. And so this is what happened. And so they, all the Christians, they are now scattered. They left Lewisham. Lewisham is now the left. You know, people have left it behind. And as they are going behind, they are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Along the way, they are going and telling people, have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about Jesus, the life that Jesus gives and the life that he transforms? You know, and, and, and so in chapter 8, in Acts chapter 8, he came in and they, they begin to kill people. So begin to kill people for following Jesus and and so you see that so they went everywhere they basically hid for their lives and they were going and they're sharing the gospel now when they share the gospel uh, uh, and then he wrote this letter to the church who are being dispersed remember everyone is now out there 
They are now in, I don't know, maybe in Brixton. I don't know. They're now uh, somewhere in Deadford. I mean, Deadford Solution. So they left and they go to Sitcap. They go to Jamaica. Some of them said, I don't want to be here. I want to go on holiday in Jamaica. But COVID you know, stopped them from going. And so they said, well, we're going to find somewhere to go. And so you find that uh, as everyone is there, so James is now writing this letter to those Christians, those two Jewish Christians who are everywhere running from being persecuted. They don't want to be persecuted. And so James then begins to pen this letter. More than likely, James takes this letter. He probably gave it to a uh, runner boy. Did you say runner boy? I don't know what you call them. You know, the messenger, postman. You know, one of the, you know, during the wars in Zimbabwe, this is where I was trying to get the term from. In the war, during the, uh, the war, they had, um, the young boys would be playing and they would be given the letters and they would run with the letters and give it to uh, the next village and then the message was transferred, you know, that way. And so James wrote this letter, he gave it to the messenger. As he gave it to the messenger, the messenger probably took it to a house where there will probably be 15 or so people gathered together. And then they would begin to, to, to read this letter. They have a meal, they begin to read this letter. And they're sharing what James is talking about. So they sit down, they have a meal, and one of them reads this letter. And now, in this book, James is writing to people who haven't got it together. He's writing to people who haven't got it together. He's writing to Christians who are messed up. Christians who have life so messed up. You know, I don't know about you, sometimes we look at our own life, we think, man. There's so much mess in our world. There's so much things that are going on. And so that's, those are the people that he's writing to. He's not writing to perfect people. He's writing to people who haven't got it all together. And, he, and, and he's trying to, uh, to encourage them. Then they begin to try and kill James. You know, when they saw that James is writing and conveying messages to these people, they tried to kill James. And what they did is they put James on the, to on the, on the top of the Mount uh, Temple. They put him right at the top there. They throw James off uh, and he hits the floor. Uh, James didn't die. He doesn't die. Because he doesn't die. Uh, they go down to him. They want him to repent. You got to repent, James. He's down there. Broken limbs, probably. James, you got to repent. De declare that Jesus is not the son of God, James. But poor James, James says, no, I'm not doing it. I saw him die, and I saw him resurrected back to life. There is no way I am going to deny that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so James says, if you have to kill me, you are going to have to kill me because I am resolved. I have made up my mind that Jesus is the son of God. How many of us here would be able to say when uh, just, a, you, know, you know, something just happened, just a little bit thing, just come your way. Many of us will not come to church. Man, when the, when the weather is nice and it's sunny out there, the church will be empty, man. Would rather be by the beach than actually be in the presence of God. Would rather be doing something else. But James says, no, I, 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 am, I, am, I, am, I am confident and this is my decision. If you are going to have to kill me, you're going to have to kill me for this. And so uh, the James, uh, uh, you, know, the, you know, what they did is basically uh, EMF's kids, uh, they beat his skull and then kill him for being a Christian. James was murdered for being a Christian. I want us to read four verses. Listen to where he starts off. He's saying this, James, a born servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me just stop right there. I don't want us to overlook this sentence because very, for many times when I've been reading that passage, I kind of sweep through fast that passage. But James, a bond servant, that word bond servant, when you look at it in the original Greek, that word bond servant, it, it, here's what it means. He's calling himself a slave. And so James is saying, I am a slave to Jesus Christ, a slave to God. Uh, my life is no more my own life. It's no longer about me, but my whole life is about God. It's about Jesus Christ, and it's about God himself. This is my identity. And so from the beginning, right on the onset, he says, James, a born servant of Jesus Christ and of the Lord God. Are you a servant? Are you a slave of Jesus Christ? 
and of God this morning? Or are you somebody who's kind of a buffet kind of thing, you dip in and out? You know, when it suits you, yes, I will save you, I will follow you, God. And when life is difficult, no way, I'm not doing whatever you ask me to do. How willing and how prepared are you to follow Jesus? And so James describes himself, he says, the, you know, born servant. You know, and he's calling himself a slave. You know, the reason why he uses this terminology is because if you are a slave to something or somebody, they have control and they have power over you. It's no more about you. Some of us in this room are slaves to certain sin in our own life. No matter how hard we try, and we have tried many times, and we have tried, I'm going to stop doing this, and I'm going to stop doing that, and we struggle, and that sin controls our lives, and, and that sin dictates what happens in our life. But this is not what James is talking about. James is saying, I am surrendered to Jesus. I have given my all to Jesus. He's talking, he's a born slave. He's a born servant, a slave that he has denied his own rights. He has denied his own life. He has denied his own will. And he's saying, it's no more about me, but it's about God. Can you see why he was willing to die? Because he had handed himself over and he says, no matter what, my life belongs to Jesus. No matter what is going on, my life belongs to Jesus. And so he, he, say, he says, I deny everything. And you see it in the very next part. He says, I'm a servant, in a born servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, I am bonded to the will of God. Are you bonded to the will of God this morning? I, I'm bonded to the will of God. I'm bonded to Jesus. I am bonded to Jesus. I'm bonded to whatever he has for my life. Whatever he wants me to do in my life. The good and the bad. Jesus, I'm bonded to you. Whatever it is, not just the good, but also the bad. When the bad comes, Jesus, I am going to stand. I am going to, to be there standing, Jesus. I'm going to allow you to be God in my life. So he starts off this way. Then he says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Again, those who are scattered because of their faith. They're scattered because of following Jesus. They've been pushed out. Listen to what he goes on to in verse 12. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Here's what he's saying. When life gets hard, have joy. When life gets hard, have joy. Have you ever tried that? Have you ever tried in a midst of things going on when life gets hard and you can't feel God, you can't see God, and, and w w you know, when people are getting diagnosed with cancer, when people are dying around you, when you lost your job, when you don't know what what's next in your life, Paul, it, John, um, J James is saying, have joy. When life at home is not good, and he's saying, have joy. When people are mistreating you, have joy. When they talk about you, whoop, whoop, have joy. And he's saying, you know, when, change your way of looking at life. Have joy about you. Have you got joy this morning? Have you got joy this morning? Amen. You got to have the joy of the Lord. So in the midst of your trials, you can stand and say, I know. My Redeemer lives. In the midst of what's going on, I can just picture, I can just picture, you know, the, you know, the disciples when they were in jail. Man, everything, they got shackles, man. They got, they got the shackles there. They're sitting down. And all of a sudden, the Bible says at midnight, they started having a praise party. They started celebrating. You are awesome in this jail, mighty God. You are awesome in this prison. My Abba Father, you're worthy of our praise. To you, our anthem we raise. You are awesome in this place. Man, when you begin to carry yourself like that, it changes the way you see your problems. All of a sudden, your problems was coming like this. All of a sudden, you're looking at it like this. 
Because all of a sudden you have changed your position. You have changed, you have elevated yourself. The Bible says that when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me, Jesus, to the rock that is higher than I, so that I may be able to stand. Our issues is that we, we allow the, the, the mounting problems to, to look at us and crowd, you know, and overpower us and we feel like we have nothing to give. But Paul, uh, J- James is saying, I keep saying Paul, but James is saying here, have joy about you. Have joy about you. When you don't feel God, have you ever been in that place where you feel like, God, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, have you ever been in that place where you're angry with God? And just say, God, I've been praying for this. And I'm not seeing any breakthrough, God. What's going on? James is saying, have joy in those seasons. And so he goes on to say, I love this word, count. You know, uh, you know some of your translations, they say consider. The Greek word for count or consider that is used here. He's saying you have to count or consider to have joy. And, and he's saying here is uh, you have to be willing to take control mentally of your circumstances. You have to be pos- willing to take control mentally of your circumstances. You have to be spiritually prepared when life gets hard. You have to be spiritually prepared. Now, I, I played uh, volleyball for my team uh, you know, at, uh, at school, and I remember the first year, I, I was just put on the on the bench, and I'll just go, you know, put on my you know uniform like everybody else, and I'll just sit like this, you know. Uh, we had very good people, and I thought I was good as well, but you know, I, somehow I found myself on the bench, and I was on the bench the first year, and my coach used to say this all the time: "Hey, honesty, you make sure you are ready for you when your name is called. You don't want to be found." unfit or not good enough so practice like you are in the game all the time work hard work hard work hard that's what he said to me he says when your name is called make sure you're ready and this is what james is saying when he's saying count when he said consider he's saying make sure you are spiritually prepared for when trials come your way the problem, the issue that we get kicked about by issues is because we are not spiritually prepared. And so when they come, we're going to address them in a carnal way, in a flesh way. Rather than actually being spiritually prepared, they vex us. Just even in this building here, before you leave, somebody can just tap on, you, on your toe by mistake. But man. The anger that's going to come, and we had so much fun last Wednesday. We're talking about you, people say you're going to see the other side of me. What other side of you are talking about? What other side of you are you talking about? You know, I, I thought Jesus saved you. I thought you were a Christian. Yeah? If you are saved, you, you know, the fruits of the Spirit are supposed to just be the things that come out of you. Patience is going to come out of you. Love is going to come out of you. No matter who is actually stepping you, no matter who is causing pain to you, the fruits of the Spirit are what's going to come out of us. So James says, you have to prepare every single day so that when trials come, you are ready. Now that word count is saying this, you have to be spiritually, get yourself ready and spiritually prepared. So when trials hit you, you will understand God has not left me. You will understand that God has not lifted his hand off of me. Because sometimes when when we go through difficult times, the enemy tells us, God doesn't love you. Uh, God is not here with you. You know, God is not with you right now because you're going through difficult time. If, if God was with you, you wouldn't go through what you're going through. Have you ever had even Christians who tell you that? Who come to you and say, oh, you know, the, the fact that this happened to you is because God is not with you. I, I've had lots of people, man, hey, Christians, or who call themselves Christians. If they're Christians, they wouldn't do that. But they call themselves Christians. God has left you. But when you are spiritually prepared you understand that God, somehow, somehow, he is working his way in me. And so J- James is bringing us that, and he's saying, I need you to be spiritually prepared. You know, you understand, you know, you understand, when you understand that God is with you, you understand God is not mad at you. 
you understand uh, that we live in a sinful and fallen world and unfortunately this is part of life on earth and we are going to go through issues. We are going to go through brokenness. We are going to go through hardships in life, each and every one of us. And so you can't escape from it. Is it easy? No. Is it painful? Yes. Is it fun? No, it's not fun at all. But he says, count, consider it joy, my brethren. I love this word when, because it's not if. The word when, is, 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 he says, when you go through a trial. You know, some of you are coming out of a trial. How many of you are coming out of a trial right now? Anybody coming out of a trial? Yeah. Different kind of trials, right? Some of us are coming out of trials. Some of us are in a trial right now. How many are in a trial right now? Yeah. A number of people, we find ourselves in the middle of a, of a trial. And it's not fun. You come to church, you want to praise God, and it's not in you. God, you sing songs, it's as if they're hitting the ceiling and they're not going beyond that. Have you ever been in that place? You come and you're trying to connect. Everybody's jumping up and down. But inside you, you just feel like I'm just going through difficult time right now. Anybody been there? And there are people who are actually right now headed for a trial. Headed for a difficult time coming ahead of you. And, and I want to bring this word from James to say to you, you need to be spiritually prepared. You need to be spiritually prepared if you are going to walk through that valley and not be drowned, you know, and not be burned. Not walk through that fire and not be burned. To walk through those waters and not be drowned. Be spiritually prepared. I want to encourage you, wherever you are, maybe before you even go out to work or whatever it is now, we work from home. Just remind yourself, put something or write something. I need to be spiritually prepared. Ask yourself, how prepared am I today spiritually? Am I spiritually prepared for when issues come? Am I spiritually prepared for when things don't go the way I thought things were going to go? And so Paul says, uh, James says that when, you know, when you go through these things. And, and if I were you, I would take scripture at its word and, and be spiritually ready. Dive into the scripture and be able to be in, that, in, the, in the word and understand what God says about God. About God says about the kind of God that he is. And be spiritually ready so when things get hard, you will say, ah, I know the Bible says that he will never leave me nor forsake me. I know that he says that I am with you no matter what you go through. Ah, enemy, I know my God is with me. And I know that he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. I know that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he is with me. But if this word is not in you, the enemy just throws whatever he throws. Guess what's going to happen? It will just, you will feel every rock. I can just picture Stephen, really. As, it, it's an amazing story. If you have never read the story, go read this, Acts chapter 7. And you begin to hear. He says, as they were stoning him, he began to see another dimension altogether. I, I have to come back to that sometime, Margaret. I, I have to come and preach about that one day. Uh, uh, but yeah, let, let's stay with James for now. And so... Uh, be spiritually ready. God is not mad at you and he didn't take his hand, but, you know, uh, he's working his way. There's a missionary, American missionary, by the name of Adam Niram Jetson. I think I've said the name correctly. I just say it confident, isn't it? Adam Niram Jetson. Adam Niram Jetson was called, he read the word of God. And, and he felt God was calling him to go to Burma. And so he went to Burma. Uh, he's 25 years old. Uh, he reads the gospel, the gospel grabs his heart, and, and he surrenders everything. I'm going to leave everything. I'm going to go to where Jesus is calls me. He becomes a born servant of Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, go to Burma. I want you to go to Burma. They need Jesus. And, and he left. This man goes to Burma, and God uses him in a mighty way in Burma. And while he's there, he ends up translating the English Bible to Burmese uh, language so they can read the Bible. Surrendered himself there. Uh, and what many people don't know is that he dealt with spiritual depression. He wrestled with spiritual depression. He is a man who has given everything to God. 
But he is a man still wrestling with the issues of life. He is a man still wrestling and, 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 and battling with spiritual depression uh, most of his life. Uh, because although he was following Jesus and he was obedient, he still had trials and sufferings in his life. Now that challenges some of our thinking that actually when God is with you, you're not going to go through trials. Have you ever had people like that? Yeah? Or maybe you might be the one that, you know, you know I don't know. But there are people that think that when you follow Jesus, you're not going to go through trials. This man, he lost three children. How do you keep serving God after losing three children? You, you've left everything, God. I left my country, my comfort, and I come, I surrender myself here. And my children, one after the other, his three children were lost. How do you keep saving God and move in faith and you lose children like that? Not one, not two, three. I want you to think, if you've got children, I want you to think, this is very hard, I know. I want you to think about that. How would you feel? Would you keep serving God after the first one, second one, third one, and still say, God, you are good? How many of us will still say, you are amazing, God. Thank you so much, God. You, I know, you know I'm going to have joy. It's very difficult, isn't it? But this, this guy, he surrendered everything to God. And, he, and, and, you know, um, and, and here's what he said, you know, he, he loses three children, and he just keeps serving God. After losing everything, he keeps serving God. Was he pained? Absolutely. Uh, you know, he, he was pained. He felt the pain. He was probably crying night after night. And here's what we have to understand about Scripture. Behind our obedience is not always blessing. Behind your obedience is not always blessing sometimes behind our obedience awaits suffering and so we need to understand but if behind obedience is suffering will you still want it how many of us will say god if behind my obedience i may go through some suffering how many of us will still say yeah you know I, 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 i'm gonna have it god not, not many of us would want that but this is what you know what we go through in life when we abandon ourselves to jesus we may go through suffering sometimes. We may go through difficulty that everyone might not understand. We may wrestle with things that people will not understand. Sometimes behind our obedience awaits suffering. Behind obedience could be the door of suffering and various trials. So you may go through all those things. But the strength in the midst of these various trials is to know the one who's sovereign. Uh, that's where we find strength. When I know that God is sovereign, when I know that God is with me, that's where I draw strength from. I don't draw strength from myself. I don't draw strength from what I've got, but I draw strength from the knowledge that God is sovereign and he is still on the throne. Amen. He's still on the throne. And to know either God has allowed this suffering before any suffering can come your way, my way, God has to allow it. I want to ask Richard and Margaret to just come for a minute, just for a minute, yeah. This was not re -asked. So Margaret, you're going to be this, the trial. And, and, and Richard, you're going to play God, right? Is that okay? Um, so before the suffering and the trial come my way. It has to pass through who? Come on, say it. Yeah, it has to pass through God. It's not like this. It's, it's never like this. Don't be afraid, Margaret. It, it's, it's never like this, right? But it's always, if you're a child of God, it's always like this. So whatever comes my way, he had to put a stamp on. He had to say, yes, go ahead. And so when, when Margaret comes this way, it means that it has passed through the Father. And the Bible, thank you, the Bible says that he will not allow anything beyond our strength to come our way. So when things come your way, the Father has given access. 
And the father said, hey, I know that you can do all things. You can stand. And so he allows us to go through that to bring us to maturity, to bring us to that position where we understand, where we live out our faith. Amen, somebody. So maybe what you're going through, God has said, I want you to go through it. God has you know, given you. Do you see how that changes the way you view your trials? And because you can say, God, God, you know, sometimes I'm always saying this. I talk to God quite a lot. And I say, God, I don't understand, God. Do you think I can deal with this one? This is so hard for me, God. And he says, I will give you the grace to walk. I'm only calling you to be faithful each and every day. Your job is to be faithful each and every day. So the presence of pain is not the absence of God. The presence of pain, he knows and he understands what's going on. He has given you, the given the access. This missionary then says, he says this, if I had not felt certain that every additional trial was ordered by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived many sufferings. If I didn't understand that God was ultimately in control of all this, I wouldn't have managed. He says, I was only able to keep going even after losing my children. I was only able to keep going because I understood that God was in control of everything. Uh, that, that's, that's, uh, that's what kept me going. And so what I did is I just keep going. I just keep doing what I know how to do. I just keep sharing the gospel and telling people about Jesus. I just keep go doing what one day at a time and keep faithful and staying faithful and doing what God has called me to do. And so he keep moving. He says, I wouldn't be able to keep moving forward. But because I know that my sovereign God, even though I don't understand what's going on, even though I don't like what's going on, but I know my sovereign God has allowed it to happen. He's with me and his hand is with me. So I'll keep marching and I'll keep doing what I know how to do. And so he keeps doing one man, one word, one obedience transformed the whole community of Burma. The whole nation was transformed because of his obedience. Because he managed to stay with it even though he was going through difficult time. I'm just going to quickly rush through uh, uh, verse 3 and 4. We just want to cover two verses to, uh, left and then we're going to go. He then says this. Um, he then says this. Encounter, you will encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Or endurance, some of your faith. Here's what he's saying. During your trials in your life. It's true. Every single time, trials will always expose this condition of your heart. Always. When you go through stuff, we know what's actually on the inside. Or you will know what's happening on the inside. And so when life is really bad and things are going on, it will expose whether you're a Christian and you mean what you say or what you sing about, what you read and talk about, what you wake up every Sunday and come, when you are going through trials, it will expose the condition of your heart. Always. And, and, and I want you to understand this because um, uh, there's something in you and in me that's so deeply rooted and ugly in all of us. You don't even know it's there until God shows you it's there. Amen? You don't realize how sinful we are. Until you are proposed with the worst sin and you want to indulge in it. Have you ever been in that place where you're sitting down and all of a sudden you catch yourself and say, hey, your mind just started sort of gravitating towards some thought that actually you think, how can I even think about that? How can I even, how can, how can it even come into my head? Have you ever been in that place? And you realize how, how sinful, how capable of being sinful we all are. You know, sometimes we see people who do all those rubbish things out there, and we think, how can they even do that? But all of us are not immune from that. When God reveals the state of our heart, if he lifts his hand off our lives, all of us are capable of doing those horrible things that other people um, do or you see and do. 
And I'm sure many of us have managed to catch ourselves. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 to 3, here's what it says. I love what it says. Listen to what, it, uh, what God did. Uh, this is what he did. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, listen to this. The wilderness in Scripture was a time of testing. It was a time of trials, a time of preparation, a time of formation. Wilderness is always in Scripture a time of of preparation, preparing you for the next step, a time of testing to prove, to remove the impurities, a time of formation, wilderness. Now look at what script, verse, that verse, same verse says. Who led them into the wilderness? God. God led them into the wilderness. And they may actually be rebuking God. Oh, God. In the name of Jesus, you know, why are we in this wilderness? Why am I going through a difficult time? Have you ever been in that place? Oh, and you speak in tongues. Yeah, whatever it is that you say. And Jesus is saying, hey, 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 I am the one who's led you into this wilderness to wake you up, to, to, to bring formation within you. Some of us, the issues that we're going through right now are there to mature us into the likeness of Jesus are there to, to, to really to test us, to remove the impurities. Now, the Spirit, remember Jesus also was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Remember that? For 40 days, uh, the Spirit led him there so that he might do what? He might humble, he might be tested, and so that he would, be, he, he would know what's in their heart. And so that, that God would know what's in their heart. What if your trial right now, whatever you're going through, just think of it. That God is saying, I want you to do something in you. I want to mature you in your walk with God. Would, you, would that change your prayer life today? Would that change the way you are viewing the trial? If God were to say, I allowed the situation that you are in so that you may grow in your knowledge of God. James tells this congregation of people, however many are listening to him, he's saying, listen, life is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Life is going to be tough for each and every one of us. But have joy. Have joy in your trials. You, your trials are not in vain. Your trials are going to produce endurance in, uh, uh, for your life. And this word endurance, it means that he's creating someone who is steadfast, who is not up, down, up, down, but someone who is steadfast and someone who is going to be unwavering in their faith. And so James is saying, when you have endurance, you are going to be unwavering in your faith. You're not going to be, yes, today I'll praise you, and oh no, things are hard for me, I'm not going to do that. But you are going to be steadfast in your following and walking with Jesus. And the Bible says that, uh, it talks about you come to a perfect and complete, uh, which means, and then the Greek word is the uh, teleos, which means to be complete and be perfected and whole. And, and what God is doing here is when we go through hard times, he's allowing spiritual maturity. He wants to see us mature. And so he sends sometimes and allows things to come our way so that we may be mature in our work with him. And the Bible says that, that we would lack nothing. Uh, the God, that God is completing the wholeness of you, of who you are and who you are going to be. And you will lack nothing. I want to finish off by saying these three things. Number one, your trials, they are not in vain. I, I think sometimes we feel uh, better if we understand that life is hard, but there is an end, there is, uh, there's a reason, there's a purpose to it. I remember when I was at school, the punishment that used to bother me the, the most, it was more than the, uh, the, you know, the, the beatings and all of that, but the punishment that used to bother me the most was the one where they say, you have to dig a hole that's, deep, that's your height with your hands up, and you can lie in it, and then after you finish digging it, you cover the hole up. And, and I, I, I remember going to the head teacher, I said, listen, at least allow me to plant a tree. Uh, then I can see the work of my hands, you know, I, I can look at it. But the idea of just doing something and, and, and then covering it in vain, that, that, that bothered me the, the most. And, and, and James is saying that your trials are not in vain. 
There is a purpose. God can use your broken life. God can use the hardship that you've gone through. God can use, yes, even your sickness that you've had to bear, you know, for the rest of your life, you know, all those things that you've had, God can use that. Uh, and, and, and God can use as a testimony of someone uh, of what he has done in your life. Your pain is not in vain. Number two, the path to spiritual maturity is often found on a path of brokenness. We grow when God has taken us in those spaces where we have been on the floor, where we felt we've been crushed, we've gone through some hardships. We mature in our faith, we mature in our walk with God. The path of spiritual maturity is often found on the path of brokenness. That's where God would take us for spiritual maturity. If God wants to grow you, he's not going to grow you on the top because you're going to become complacent. He will take you and he will break you. He will put you in a position of brokenness. And then from there, hope starts to rise. From the ashes, hope starts to rise. And I'm telling you, when you come out of that, you are a lot stronger than when you, uh, when you first started. Because God will use those situations. God will bring us to the Red Sea. So that, uh, you know, the places that I can't part for myself, but only he can part them. And at the end, I'll say, all oh, glory and praise back to you, God. I give you all the glory. Uh, because if he didn't have Red Sea moments, we wouldn't be able to see the hand and understand the power and the strength and the presence of God at work in our lives. And so the third thing, God will allow trials in our lives, often for your good and for his glory. Now, many people struggle with that. I was sharing uh, with one of my friends this week when I was talking about what I'm talking about. And he struggled with the third point. He says, hey, man, I've lost my mom. I've lost a loved one. Are you telling me that God will allow trials in our lives for our good and for his glory? I don't see any good in, in what has happened. I'm crying every, every night. I, 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 I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm just struggling with that, with that. So he struggled with that whole idea. You know, and, and God will allow trials in our lives, often for his glory and for your good. So some of the trials that you're going through, they are for your good. And so you've got to begin to praise God in those trials and say, thank you, Lord, because you've got faith in me of what I'm going through. I'm going to finish with this story. My brother Clive, um, he lost three of his children. And I remember when mom died in the space of two months, Clive, my brother, he lost a mother, and then a few weeks later, lost a son. And I remember I was home that time. Um, I'd gone to attend my mom's funeral. And as I was there, the son just became very unwell all of a sudden. And we had to rush. The, the, you know, and, and he says to me, I, I, I'm not going in. You have to go in. I'm not going in. I just can't go in. I just can't go in. And I said, yeah, I'll go in. I went in and the, the baby just gasping for oxygen and struggling and all of that. Unfortunately, we lost the baby three weeks later from my mom's funeral. And then later on, the, you know, the wife, when she had the, the baby died, they all stayed outside. I went in with the baby. She just went into a coma uh, with a shock of just losing another child. And so she went into a total coma, and, and she never survived that coma. She died because of the shock uh, that she experienced. So in a space of about two months, my brother lost a mom, lost a son, and lost a wife. How do you keep going? You are the pastor. How are you going to encourage somebody like that? And I remember just sitting and talking to my brother, and I say, my brother, I can't comprehend what has happened. I don't understand what's going on. I feel your pain, and, and I know my words are empty, and I know God loves you, and I know everything works together for good, but I don't understand. I'm not, I don't have any answer. But all I know, God is God. And I remember just sharing with him, and just praying, and I say to him, you know, you need to commit yourself to Jesus. He was a bit wishy-washy then in his walk with God. But from that day, he started, he gave his life to Jesus. He says, I'm going to follow Jesus. And many people struggled with that. They said, man, how do you follow Jesus after you have lost everything? How do you keep going? How do you even have faith? And I asked him that question. 
And he says, I had nothing to lose. I had lost everything, and my life is now in Jesus' hand. I don't own my life. And he says, all I'm going to do is I'm going to save God. And many of you know, that's how he ended up working with OM. And just saying, I'm just going to abandon myself and give myself um, to Operation Mobilization, where they travel from country to country to country, just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm just going to give myself to that. And then he later himself died. But you know, in all of this, James is saying, have joy. Have joy. No matter what is going on, James says, have joy. Have joy because it's going to be okay. Even though you don't understand. Have joy because God is in control. Have joy because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Have joy. It's going to be okay. Have joy. That's what James is talking about. At the end of Revelation, we win. Have joy. If you look at the scoreboard, at the end, we win. And so no matter what we're going through right now, have joy. The scoreboard says we have already won. Um, so have joy. I want us to pray. Let's pray. Are there are many, many of us here who may be going through a difficult time. And you feel like giving up. And you feel you don't understand what's going on. But I want to say keep going. Have joy. Keep going. Be faithful. Have joy and know that God will use this. Have joy. Have joy. I have no clue where you are at this morning in your walk with God. But I want you to hear my heart today. Some of you here may not have picked the Bible, you know, for, you know, I don't know, for a long time in your life. There is no greater place to know about the character of who God is than in the Bible. The Bible is his love story. It's his love story to you. And I challenge you, church, to read it on your own. Don't, don't just go on what we talk about here on, on Sunday. It's not enough. Those are just crumbs of maybe me spending time and just digging into the Bible, spending hours and just digging into the Bible. There is power and there's transformation. There's hope and, uh, in, the, in the scriptures. And I want to encourage you to give yourself to the scripture. There's strength in the scriptures. There's transformative power in the scriptures. There's spiritual healing in the scriptures. There's spiritual uh, there's salvation in the scriptures. There's comfort in the scriptures. There's everything you need for life in the scriptures. I want to challenge you today, every man and every woman of Jesus Christ in this church, if you don't know where to start, I want to encourage you to go to the book of James as we go. If you have never read the Bible, I want to encourage you, go to the book of James, the first few verses. Memorize these two verses so that you will know when life is hard. You'll be able to know God is still in control. God is still in control. I'm here to remind you again, God is still in control. God is still in control. The enemy makes it very hard for us to sometimes repent and confess the ugly things in our heart because we are afraid to confess. But that's where healing and that's where wholeness and sanctification takes place the enemy doesn't want you to confess he would rather he wants you to suppress it but confession there's freedom in confession there's freedom uh, in confession i don't know where you are in life today this was just a simple introduction to the book of james but i think you know i think about all these shoes that we have here I don't know who owns them. I don't need to know. The walks of life they've gone through, the pain, the terrains that they've walked, and these shoes, they tell a story. They tell a story of where you have walked in life. I don't know what life has brought to you. I don't know which direction you are walking in today. I don't know whether you're walking in the wrong direction or in the right direction. Maybe 
the trials, the pains that you're going through, maybe you caused them. The great news is they still hope. As you were coming in today, you saw that poster. Maybe you, you now don't see it. But I want to encourage you as you're walking out today, just look at the cross. Underneath the cross it talks about hope. There's hope today. There's still hope. The great thing about Jesus is that he can step, he can order your steps. You may be walking in one direction and he will change your direction. You may be wearing running shoes today and you're running away from God. And you've been running for the rest of your life, running. We've got running shoes. And Jesus is saying, hey, 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 I need you to come. I need you to slow down. I want you to, to give yourself, to surrender yourself. I want you to come and I want to order your steps. I want you to surrender the rest of your footsteps to me today, Jesus says. And so if you haven't surrendered your footsteps to Jesus, I want to encourage you today to say, Jesus, I want to surrender the rest of my footsteps to you, God. Would you order my steps, God? Would you order my life, God? Because you see, someone is ordering, is directing your footsteps. It's either God ordering your footsteps or the devil ordering your footsteps. Here's what I believe. Because the scripture says in Ephesians 6 that there is principalities of unseen world. And so there's somebody who is ordering and directing your footsteps. If it is not Jesus, I fully believe it's the enemy that's directing your footsteps. And I know where the enemy wants to take you, uh, where these footsteps of the enemy wants to take you is directing you straight to destruction, to hell. I know the church doesn't talk about hell pretty much. But there are only two parts. One that is directed by Jesus Christ, where he says the Spirit orders the steps of the righteous. And the other path is directed by the enemy himself, and that leads to destruction. I don't want anybody in this room to die and be able to go to hell. I, 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 I just, this is my prayer. Uh, every time I preach, this is why I always create space here. I say, God... In the name of Jesus, I don't want anyone in my church, Lord, to come Sunday after Sunday. But in the last day, God, be able to stand before you and you say, depart from me. I never knew you. And they end up in destruction, God. We refuse that as a church, Father, in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, if there's anybody here today who needs to surrender their lives, who needs to give their life to you, Jesus... Father, would you give them the boldness? Would you give them, Father, the boldness? Yes, it's going to be hard. And if you want, get somebody next to you and just say, would you walk this road with me? Would you help me? I want to give my life. I want to just surrender my all to Jesus. I want to be a born servant of Jesus Christ. I want to be a slave of Jesus Christ. If it's you, I want you to stand where you are and just stand and just say, God, yeah, I realize, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to die and go to hell, uh, but I really want to be in that place where I can have life and have it to the full. Is there anybody here uh, who would say, yes, pastor, I, I realize somebody was ordering my steps and it's not Jesus. Here's the question I would ask you. If you walk out of this room today and you are run over by a car or anything, God forbid, and you die today, would you go to heaven right now as you are? And if you answer no, my sister, my brother, I want to encourage you to put things right with Jesus. I want to encourage you to be in that place where you surrender your all to Jesus. And those that are Christians here, I want to encourage you also to ask God, expose my faults, expose my heart, Lord, so you, I can be sanctified into the likeness of Jesus. Maybe you're a Christian and ask God, show me my weaknesses, God. Show me my life, Lord, things that are not right in my life. If you, if you think that your hands are, are clean, you're lying to yourself. Nobody in this room has got clean hands. All of us, our hands are dirty. They're only clean because of what Jesus has done. And so if it's you today, you want to give your life, please stand and I will pray with you. I know it's going to be difficult. I know it's hard. Uh, but that's, you know, there's no other way by which we are saved other than 
by knowing and surrendering our all to Jesus, our life to Jesus. Is there somebody? Or is there somebody who's saying, God, I just want to order, I want you to order my steps. My life has not been right. Yes, I've given my life, but things are not right. And I, I, I'm just not stable. When, when hardships come, I just find myself going up and down. Is there somebody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father God, would you honor the steps of my sister here today? Lord, I just see uh, Stephen um, just choosing to say, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny myself my comfort. God, you, Father, would you order her steps, Lord, each and every day, Lord. Lord, I pray even right now, honor her, Father, in the name of Jesus. You know what's the desires of her heart. And Lord, I want to speak to her right now in Jesus' name. And I want to pray, Father, Spirit of God, would you feel her from head to toe, Father, with your presence and your glory, that no matter what she goes through, God, may she know your hand, Father, your hand upon her, Father, just to say, I am with you. I am with you in camp. I'm with you. I am with you. And, Father, I pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, give her a word to hold on to, Father. Give her a word right now, Father. And Lord, whatever trials she may be going through, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, give her the grace, Father, to walk through them, Father. Give her the grace and the tenacity and the perseverance that she needs. I pray in the name of Jesus, your richest blessings upon her, Father. And I pray, would you bless her work? Would you bless her home? Would you bless her coming and her going, Father? May heaven be opened over her life. And if you are sitting around, I just want to ask you, just reach your hand to Sister and Cam, and let's pray and just ask God, would you bless her in Jesus' name? Lord, I pray, bless, Lord. Release an anointing right now over her life, Lord. Bless her, Father. In the name of Jesus, come on, church, let's stand with her. Let's pray for her. Let's pray for Sister and Cam right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord. May heaven be opened over her life, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Release, Father, whatever you have in store for her, Father, whatever the enemy has robbed of her, Father, in the name of Jesus, her joy. May she have her joy back, Father. May she have everything that heaven has ordained over her life, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, would you walk this road with her? Would you encourage her, Father? Would you build her up, Father? Would you mature her? Father, into a woman of God, into a woman, Father, who is unwavering, a woman, Father, who is steadfast in her walk with you, God. Father, we lift it up to you, Father. We agree as a church your blessing upon her. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And I pray, Father, for anyone who is going through sickness right now in the room, anyone who's suffering, Father, anyone who's going through hardship, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, would you release, Father, an anointing over them. Give them grace, Father. Help them to keep walking, Father, one foot in front of the other. We bless your name, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we are thankful for this church, God. What a great church, a great people that we have here, Lord, who love you, Jesus. They want to be used by you, Father. And I pray we surrender to you, Father. We surrender our all to you, God. God, in this church, there are people that are going through difficult times, difficult things, Father, who are going through hard things, Father. Father, we don't know, you know behind the stories. We don't know what's going on, but God, you will meet. Will you just meet, Father? Meet them, Father, wherever they are, Father. Meet them where they are at, Father. Meet them, Father, and help them, Father. And I pray that we create space, Lord, that when we come to the church, Lord, when we come here, Lord, we will go home transformed. We will go home having had and having met up with you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing the last song. Thank you so much, church. God bless you. And thank you for joining us online. May God bless you. And we pray also that if you may be going through a difficult time, please do let us pray with you and let us stand with you. If you're not able to stand today, uh, do pull us after the service and just say, I want you to pray for my situation. And we want to pray with you. It should not be like that. And we pray, God, to give you the grace to keep walking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.